Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of MECFS Alert. I am joined today in Palo Alto, California, by Dr. Ron Tompkins, who is attending a conference here. Doctor, welcome back to the broadcast. Well, thank you. Very, very good much. to see you. Thank you. Now, as I remember, you're at Harvard, right? Yes. The Harvard Medical Center. And you've had a very extraordinary career. You were an engineer who became a surgeon who abandoned surgery for myalgic encephalomyelitis and the study of inflammation, correct? Uh, generally speaking, uh, it's well, correct. Don't hesitate to straighten me out if I got it all <laughs> wrong. Um, how, how is the study of ME going? Uh, w thank you very much for asking, and it's a pleasure to be here. We uh, have uh, been exploring uh, all the interest within our Harvard medical environment on the disease and are very heartened by the fact that there are hundreds of physicians and scientists within our overall institution who not only are knowledgeable but and contributory but are very interested in our collaborative uh, efforts as as a center. Uh, we held a, just to briefly describe, the Harvard affiliated hospitals include Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, the Beth Israel uh, Deaconess Medical Center, and multiple actually almost 30-something institutions such as Boston Children's Hospital and Dana-Farber Institute and many others. Our, I am based at Massachusetts General Hospital, but uh, within our Harvard Medical environment have reached out to make this a collaborative among all the Harvard institutions. And we've had a tremendous uh, response. We held a sympo scientific symposium followed by a public symposium um, in June and I originally intended it to be a small affair for about 50 and, uh, scientists and clinicians. Um, and I had to turn down at least that many because I uh, individuals who would like to have attended. So I'm finding a tremendous interest in the medical and scientific community. And this is somewhat cross-disciplinary. Right? Correct. These Correct. Are people These are many different medical disciplines as well as scientific disciplines. And the attendant... Uh, uh, infrastructure builders like engineers who build devices that kind of thing is there a crossover there there is a, a, a modest crossover we do a number of engineering activities um, at uh, MGH Mass General Hospital as well as uh, MIT our MIT affiliation so that uh, that component of it the technical uh, component is also very important. We're working collaboratively with Stanford and a lot of what Stanford is has focused on is technical so we try not to be too competitive but from a medical science and clinical trials perspective we really do have a wonderful opportunity to contribute uh, in the field of MECFS. I'm thinking of things like the nano engineering that is part of the nano needle. That's uh, that kind that of certainly is technology headed, is headed by uh, Stanford. We are delighted to participate and help in uh, um, testing uh, in uh, multiple different areas. We do have some technologies that we would like to explore in uh, MECFS. We do have many specialized facilities that are quite unique in the world. Uh, one being the Martinez Center, which is primarily uh, magnetic resonance imaging, but uh, the dual instrumentation means having MRI combined with positron emission uh, uh, tomography, PET. And it has two instruments that are pretty unusual, if not unique in the world. There's one for the head and one for the body. 
And it becomes quite important if you're beginning to localize neural inflammation. Neural inflammation, it's just part of the, it's likely part of the systemic inflammation that clearly exists in MECFS. And, but there might be particular nuclei, particularly in the brain stem and other regions of the brain that have what we would call a glial activation, microglial activation, that type of neural inflammation. This is a very hot area in many neurological disorders. Um, Alzheimer's, is a, it's become a much more interesting from a pharmacological approach in Alzheimer's d disease to attack the neural inflammation more than the, t the tau or, uh, protein or tangles. And we would like to do a similar thing in MECFS. And for example, the Martino Center offers a unique op uh, opportunity to actually do that. So localize very specifically nuclei that are involved in the disease process. Have already done similar studies in Lyme disease as well as in fibromyalgia. Do you think there's a relationship between Lyme disease and ME or a relationship, fibromyalgia, there's been thought to be a relationship for quite a long time. My personal opinion about it is there has a tremendous amount of overlap. They do, you know, it, it says something as a doctor if you describe a disease by its symptoms. What it really says is you don't know much about it. And post-treatment Lyme disease is described by its symptoms and it has a, a, a particular focus on arthralgias. But many of the other symptoms, such as fatigue and malaise, that are part, of, part and parcel of the disease, have some similarities in MECFS. And, and fibromyalgia is, is more of a pain disorder uh, of a focal or diffuse nature, but it also has many of the fatigue, malaise, and other symptoms that you find in MECFS. So in my mind, um, I think there are many similarities that we should probe and define more carefully. When we bring publicity to Harvard and your organization, your, your affiliations, um, where does the patient fit in? And patients write to me and call me and want to know how they can see this or that specialist. Uh, may not be the right person, they may not even be a doctor, they may be a researcher. Uh, what do you say to patients? Uh, here you are sitting in the center of so much that's going on. Is there a place there for patients? Is there a treatment available there? Uh, there is ongoing, there are ongoing clinical treatment uh, programs. As you know, uh, treatment of of patients with MECFS, because the disease is so complex, uh, requires a tremendous amount of resources. And there are a number of very dedicated clinicians who for 30 or 40 or more years have been very interested and active in caring for patients with MECFS. The basic problem, however, is we do not currently have the resources necessary to provide the proper care for everyone. Uh, there is, these clinicians are incredibly dedicated to the care of these patients, but they have to be limited because of just simply the resources. We are interested and have proposed and are looking for philanthropic support to expand those resources because we have the clinicians and scientists who are not only knowledgeable but actively care for these patients and would like to expand that activity. How we about, call it a center of excellence. How about the education of young doctors? How do we interest young doctors in ME? Uh, most of them seem to come out of medical school not knowing much about it or nothing about it whatsoever. Our trainees, <clears throat> um, we have many trainees within our, our environment, um, uh, easily thousands each year. 
um, in the various uh, disciplines. I think that many of them, even if they are well trained and educated in MECFS, find it difficult to establish a practice that is directed purely at MECFS. They financially cannot afford to do it. Many of our trainees are finishing their training with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and they're required to repay those. Many have hard times buying their first home because of their crushing debt they have to begin with. And in the, let's just face it, in the MBCFS environment, the reimbursements and the ability to uh, financially support a practice, and in, certainly you can have private patients who can pay $500 or $1,000 for a visit, but that's, that's just a very small group of the patient population. And if you look for public reimbursement or private insurance reimbursement, the, none of those are actually fairly uh, reasonable. So it, it turns out, in many instances, less of a knowledge deficit than it is actually a financial impracticality. And I th that is one of the huge challenges, I think, in the field of MECFS. Many other disorders have addressed that, and uh, in the field of eating disorders, there are many special uh, programs for that, and certainly in the field of, uh, if you want an advocacy group, look at uh, the HIV community, and have corrected these so that physicians can spend time and, and focus on this broader population. Certainly, there are a lot more MECFS patients out there than there is recognition in the system. What is your daily um, work? Every day when you go to the lab, what do you work on? Uh, I, I mostly try to get people to work together. Um, <clears throat> our, our background is uh, heavily in inflammation and metabolism and uh, many of our tools are proteomics and genomics, for which we know lots about, and computational biology. And, uh, but in a complex medical environment where there, there are regulatory features and practical and financial and other features, I spend much of my time uh, trying to come up with practical solutions to all these challenges. But uh, I'm very hopeful, and we certainly have spent a lot of time at this, although with adequate resources in the field of injury research, and I would love to see us being properly uh, supported with an infrastructure to do this same thing in MECFS. If, if you were to ask me how the disease um, originates. Uh, I, I happen to know a lot about how the, the host response to stress occurs. That's much of what I have studied for three decades now. And it seems to me, and these stress comes from many different forms. It can be physical injury, it can be infectious you know, or septic stress, or it can even be emotional um, and uh, psychological stress, and each of us handles that a little differently. We all come to the table with a little bit different genetics and genomics, and it seems to me in these patients, most patients return to a normal healthy state, but it doesn't seem like that that occurs in these patients. They persist in some of the immunological and metabolic problems that were a part of their stress, and they never seem to get over it. And their threshold to, for the, to decompensate is, is a very low threshold, almost and of course it varies with the severity and the phase of the disease, but it just, I see so much of their disease as portions that I, that I fully appreciate are related to stress. 
and the failure to return to normal after that. And I think that's poss possibly the reason why this is such a tough nut to crack. Because most clinicians, you know, in medicine we, we know diabetes and we worry about glucose and insulin and in heart disease we know a lot about circulatory problems and valvular problems. And you can point to those as causing the d disease. But in this case, it's not so easy to point to exactly what the cause of the disease is. And so thinking about it from a different framework, I think is going to offer some opportunity to advance here. Empirically, but not scientifically, it would seem that onset is often associated with physical activity in people who are athletic. Uh, at least that's my experience. A lot of them were athletes, some uh, at a high level, but all loved and engaged in athletics when they were struck down. Uh, have you looked at that, this role of uh, uh, people who were fit, quote, fit, unquote, uh, as opposed to other patients? Is that a part of the study? I think that <clears throat> and I'm trying to take advantage of things that we know in great detail in normal healthy people and after a severe physical stress. And one of those areas we know a tremendous about is what happens in the skeletal muscle. And so part of our focus is to get an idea of what is different in a patient with ME-CFS at baseline and then after some uh, level of stress that is tolerable and why does their muscle not recover as quickly as it does in a healthy person? And I agree with you, one of the things that drew me to this field was the very large number of young people who were actually more physically active than normal, and yet almost to the day they can tell you when they were struck with this problem. and or maybe it was not sudden, but maybe it was over the course of, you know, a few months or a year or after, let's say, a viral stress or a pneumonia or something, but they never got back to normal. And you ask them the question, you know, if I could make you normal, what would you do? They know instantly what they would want to do. They want to recover their former life. And uh, that's just very, it's impressive to me. And I had that conversation with so many young people. It's not all, but it, it's just, as a doctor, that just strikes me as something really important. You've had these multiple careers, which you said I more or less accurately. Uh, <laughs> it's not worth going into <laughs> uh, details. Well, but having been an engineer, a surgeon, and now a clinician, uh, which one have you found the most rewarding? Oh, they're all, uh, actually I haven't done them separately. Um, so this, it's worth this comment. I, ha I was in the midst of my surgical training at Mass General and um, I thought that looking forward in, for my career that te technology was probably going to creep into medicine at an increasing rate. So during my surgical residency, I went to MIT and got a PhD in chemical engineering and then returned and finished my residency. And over the years, we had, we, I, I ultimately recruited two other similar individuals in my division and we all became Harvard professors and I have had and enjoyed a very fruitful uh, research effort that is engineering, quantitative in medicine and biology. And so we've tended to blend it um, over the many years. And we take an engineer's view of medicine. We understand the biology and the, and the technical details, but we've taken a practical engineering approach uh, to the problems. And about 20 years ago, my, my, three co my two colleagues and I decided that we can continue to write papers or we can do things that we can reduce to practice and commercialize so that it would actually help many more people. Publications 
don't necessarily help many people, but creation of practical tools that can be commercialized uh, is very important. And I've been involved in uh, 10 such companies over the last 20 Give years. Give me an idea of the kinds of things that have been commercialized. Uh, one company, we were interested, at, and so this may sound strange, but um, uh, it was, came along about the time that we were, my wife and I were having children, and uh, my wife was uh, approaching 34, so I had to have those awful amniocentesis, or, or cervical biopsies, and I thought, that this is ridiculous. So that uh, we developed a company to identify genetic abnormalities in a fetus during the first uh, trimester of pregnancy. When, when the woman goes for their first obstetrical examination, hopefully during their first trimester, a blood test would otherwise replace um, amniocentesis, and that company was commercially viable and it actually was purchased for $450 million. So uh, our, th our thoughts were to eliminate amniocentesis. Um, with another company who was, we're, we're always worried about re bacterial resistance, and so understanding how bacteria um, control their pathogenicity was another area of interest, and that ultimately has become a company. Um, oh, I, I could go on for quite some time, but uh, so this that this changed this, medicine. It also uh, introduces a dynamic, which is profit, as a possibility at the end of long years of research. Uh, certainly, it has been profitable for our investors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Doctor, it's a great pleasure to have you on. I, I will check on your bio. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. It's an honor. Thank you.